works and uh, what it does. And, and uh, one of the messages I have here is every kind of funding you see up there brings you more than just money. It brings you other supports, with the exception of debt. Debt doesn't really bring you a whole lot more, but it's easy. But these other things, if you do it right, you get more out of it than you uh, may in just the money itself, which is part of growing your business as well. So what we're going to do is talk about trends in funding, what's kind of coming up or where, where we are today with it. Talk about different sources of funding that list you saw on the previous page, and then tips about fundraising as well. Before we get into that, uh, what kind of uh, funding are you guys looking for? Let's just go around the room real quick and say what your interest is. You're raising money, not raising money, what you're looking for, for example. What, what's your interest in fundraising? I'm not sure yet. So. Yeah. How about you? Same here. I'm working on two, three ideas, but it was good, always good to know about how to do it. Cool. Uh, I am bootstrapping right now, okay. but um, people keep saying that when my business catches on, it will explode, and I'm really not sure what to do with that. Um, I, I want to have some ideas. If I get a lot of orders really fast, how do I, how do I scale up? Okay. That? What kind of product do you make? Um, you and I talked briefly quite a while back. Uh, I have a downsizing kit and a downsizing uh, coaching business that I'm uh, working on expanding. Okay. Cool. I mean, there's, there's other other solutions than these and kind of broad ones, so we can talk more as well. I'm interested in fundraising for nonprofit organizations. Okay. There's a, a lot of these things apply to nonprofit as well as for profit, mm -hmm. especially in the crowdfunding world. The, my message is always that the principles of fundraising have not changed, but the technologies and the formats have changed. And that's what we have to go forward with. But the fundamental principles, and we'll bring those up, are still the same for everybody. Uh, I'm still dabbing around uh, nothing concrete yet. But uh, my interest is what is considered that would be financed through funding, what shouldn't be, and I mean, just understanding what could be and what wouldn't be financed, and obviously how to do that project. So uh, cool. that's where I'm coming from. All right. We'll talk about some of that as well. One of the best ways of funding is what I call customer funding, that is, it's selling the product and a lot of people are trying to create a software business or whatever, and they're trying to sell subscriptions, and those are all the right things to do, except you need a lot of money up front to get the software in place. And one of the techniques you can use is what I call customer funding, where you go sell a custom version of your stuff to somebody for a higher price, but they're helping you build out your software. So whatever you get a customer to pay for, that comes first. What you can't get them to pay for, this comes second. Right. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Cool. Well, let's look into some of this and uh, talk more. If you have questions along the way, let's stop. It's very interactive here as well. So, um, I, uh, my background is I worked at, uh, I graduated from YouTube at MBA. I worked at National Insurance for 24 years and then uh, started doing angel investing and got into that. And over the years, I started three angel networks. I started the Central Texas Angel Network, I started the Baylor Angel Network, and we had a Wilco Angel Network, which we later turned into a funding portal called Wilco uh, Funding Portal itself. And so I now, after the three angel networks, I now run three different crowdfunding portals, and we help Texas businesses raise funding. And so we work on the early stage startup for the most part. There's plenty of debt, there's plenty of private equity and later stage funding, but for the early stage, uh, it's a new and changing marketplace, and so we're working very hard on it. So the trend in funding is, number one, there's more sources of capital out there. Some people think there's fewer, but there's really more. There's a lot more out there, uh, and I have a list of 81 of those, and uh, if you're of interest, grab a card afterwards and, uh, if, and email me, and I'll email you back the PDF. If I, I, I want to have them on the slide, and I can read them because they're a little, little tiny, and we'll, we'll talk about them at a high level, but basically there's a lot of sources of funding out there. But the key here is that the amount you get from each source is actually going down. It's getting smaller, so you have to go to more groups, and you have to go to more types of funding sources that are out there. And one reason for that is the web makes it very easy to access more groups, but the money is now spread out. <coughs> when I was at the Central Texas Angel Network, which we started in 2006, 
angel investors would bring in, and those are accredited investors, people in the SEC say they can invest in startups because they're very risky. They would bring in a $50,000 check and they look around the room and at the end they'd say, okay, you get the check. Today, they bring in a $50,000 check, look around the room and they say, okay, five for you, five for you, five for you, five. And they spread it across more deals. And so that's what you'll find is that the dollars are smaller per group because they're funding more deals and they're spreading it across more, but there's also more sources as well. If I had done this number 81 10 years ago, I think it would have been more like 41. And so there's quite a few more out there. Second thing is, um, investors back you know, 10 years ago were generalists. When we built the Central Texas Angel Network, we had 50 investors, and they were general business people, and they invested in what we found in our backyard, basically. It was just general investments and so forth. Uh, today, what you'll find is that the investors have become much more narrow in their investment pieces. You know, they come in now, they say, well, the answer is medical devices. I don't want to see just medical devices. And so for that reason, as they narrow their interests, they then expand their geography. Instead of just investing around the area, they're now looking across the country for the best medical device deals they can find. And so you'll find that among a lot of these angels is that they're getting much more narrow in what they want to do. Consequently, some angel networks are becoming more specialized. They're going to be just IT or focused, or they're going to be just healthcare focused or whatever. And there, there's some efficiency that comes with that. That's why they're doing it. So you'll find that the uh, choices are becoming more specialized in that case. Um, also, what you'll find is that there's crowdfunding. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. And there's a lot of platforms and different models that are coming out. You know, 10 years ago, there was Kickstarter, and that was about it. You were just prepaying for something. Today, there's interest rate, you know, Jobs Act. There's equity crowdfunding. And there's a dozen different crowd lending models that are out there, so there's a lot more choices out there. We'll talk about some of those here in a minute. And the last one is, is that the concept of data analytics is coming up more. Because there's so many sources out there, there are tools that help you figure out which funding sources are right fit for you. I also work in the venture capital space, and there's uh, 3,000 what are called micro VCs. They have a 25 to $50 million fund. There's 3,000 of them out there. I talked to one the other day that they actually fund deals that work for uh, first responders. If you worked with the police or the fire department or the ambulance, they funded those deals, nothing else. And so they're being very narrow on what they do. And now, so what Data Analytics does is it tells you where you ought to go to find your funding. So the funding sources that are out there, here's a list of the 81, is there's 14 accelerators, there's three crowdfunding portals, there's 16 angel networks, and this is more in the, uh, the broader area here. There's uh, five angel funds. There's four what are called revenue-based funds. Have you guys heard of revenue-based funding? The idea behind revenue-based funding is I'm going to invest in your business, and instead of getting an equity stake, you're going to give me a piece of the revenue until I get a certain return back. And it's going to be 5% of revenue, and you're going to give me 1.5 times my money, so I give you 100,000. You're going to pay me back 140,000, and 5% in is set, and the payback is set. But how long it takes now will depend upon how you do in the business. It, it's better than debt in the sense that it rides a wave of your revenue stream versus fixed payments. So that's how that works. And there's a lot of businesses that like that because they don't want to give up ownership. I see a lot of family businesses where. We talk about equity raises and we get down to it, the answer is, well, we're never selling this business to pay back the investor. Therefore, equity is not a good fit. Revenue-based funding is a better fit. And then there's also about 27 venture capital firms in the area, and there's 10 life science funds in the area, and there's two grant funds in the area as well. And so there's 81 sources that you can find on that list that I'll send to you that uh, go through it. So, and Two things I always put up there is if anybody ever has anything related to the University of Texas, you know, technology out of UT, they actually have a fund that will help you fund that. It's called the UT Horizon Fund. That may fit you guys or not. They also at UT have what's called the uh, Texas Health Catalyst Grants Program, and they'll give you money to help start a business there as well. And then the last one, probably not here, but in other places, there's people that are doing cancer therapies and cancer prevention technologies. Uh, they've done about uh, it's a $500 million fund. They've granted 35 people uh, approximately $20 million each to do this. And so those exist out there as well. 
of course, in cancer, that's just kind of getting things going. It doesn't really fund the whole thing there as well. But other areas are things like accelerators, and there's many accelerators that are out there. There's people that are doing tech, consumer, food, social impact, and more. And uh, some provide funding and access to funding as well. And you have groups like Texas Venture Labs, Austin Technology Incubator, and Capital Factory. And the key with accelerators is they give you basic startup mentorship in addition to funding. So whenever you're going for funding, you also want to ask the question not only how much do I need, but also what help do I need in addition to the funding. And so if I need basic business startup, well then you ought to be looking at accelerators. If you don't need basic business startup, you might find better funding elsewhere, and we'll go through that list. And so what you'll find is, uh, I got a list of the accelerators on the program that go through and show you what they're doing. Oftentimes you're taking a percent of equity in order to have give you the funding that helps you get the basics going. And, but most of you're getting mentorship that's out of it. Uh, next is crowdfunding. And the three main kind I like to work on is number one, there's rewards, prepayment, uh, like Kickstarter. Anybody ever done a Kickstarter campaign? Okay. Um, so I always want to put it up there, you know, Kickstarter is great because it does what I call product validation. Will people buy your product? And the beautiful thing about Kickstarter is before you ever build it, and you know you can go see if uh, anybody will buy it and will they pay for it. And I know a lot of people that use Kickstarter just for market validation. They never actually take the money; they just put it up there. They do A/B testing with the name and the price and the position and so forth. And they once they figure out what oh right price is this, you call it this, and then we'll just they then they go off and they just sell it. But for the most part, it's a great way to actually test out your product before you actually get too far out there in the marketplace and it can be a low cost. Next one is what's called Texas Interstate or Title III, and we'll talk about that more here in a moment, but are you guys familiar with the JOBS Act or Title III? It's, uh, JOBS Act stands for Jumpstart Our Business Startup, and it basically it is a law that Obama put in place in 2012. It took the SEC almost four years to come out with the detailed rules, but it says anybody can invest, and if you're not a credit investor, you can actually you can invest up to a certain amount, but not as much as you want. And for people that have a large network of non-accredited investors, restaurants, retail, breweries, and so forth, typically they want everybody in the room to be able to invest, that's a good option for you. And people are now using that to go raise money. And so what's the limit? In, well, for the JOBS Act, it's a, it's a calculation based on income. For the Texas interstate version, Texas came up with their own version. We all have to be in Texas. Not a credit investors are limited to five thousand dollars per deal per year. So if I'm not a credit and I like your deal, five k, like your deal, five k, like your deal, I can do that all day. I just can't put more than five k into one deal because it spreads out. And so the credit investors can put as much as they want. And people are raising two hundred fifty, three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars on those interstate, those jobs act portals. And like I say, funding in these formats really come back to your oh, network. Sorry about that. The um, it's just how many people you know, how many people support you. And like I say, if you've got five high net worth guys that love your deal, we'll just do an angel equity raise, no problem. If you have 50 to 100 people that are not accredited, you have choices now to use those other portals to find it as well. And then equity crowdfunding is basically raising money from accredited investors. Anybody know the definition of an accredited investor? It's the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, came out several years ago and said, okay, investing in startups is very risky, you put a lot of money in, you lose all your money, we don't want people to be in the poor house. So only high net worth individuals can do that. And so if you have a million dollars in net worth, not counting the house you live in, you're a, an accredited investor. If you don't have a million dollars, then you're not an accredited investor. And up until we had these acts here, you could not invest in a startup. And so some people have networks like that, some people don't. But that's how angel groups and those are, they're all built on accredited investors that are investing in these deals. So do, the accredited, so do these uh, accredited investors need to invest minimum and minimum amount on a yearly basis? No, uh, it's uh, everybody writes their own check for how much they want to write it for. It, the entrepreneur usually sets the minimum. I don't want anybody putting in less than $10,000 by putting less than fifty thousand dollars because the the lower the minimum the more people you need you get too many people it's hard to hard to manage in that case so going back to this uh rewards pre-sell campaign we talked about that a little bit 
you know, key, key websites are usually Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Most everybody's going to those two websites. And we always recommend you go out and have people coming to me saying, I want to raise equity money, but I want to use crowdfunding. Well, have you ever done a campaign like Kickstarter? Well, no. Let's go do a Kickstarter campaign. Because what you find is, uh, when you go to pre-sell it, is you're going to start to build your customer network. You now have people that are in it. You're going to understand customer requirements. Eisenhower once said, no battle plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. So no business plan ever survives first contact with the customer. Once you start going out talking to customers, it will start to change your business, your price, your model, your position, and that's a good thing, and so forth. And then it demonstrates support for your idea. And the reason I bring that up is when I stand in the angel rooms or the network rooms and so forth, just about every week somebody comes in and basically says, and different ways. Well, I didn't put any money in. My family didn't put any money in. Nobody bought anything. No one invested. I don't believe it. And, you know, with, with no one in this thing, you start looking around saying, well, I don't want to be first. And so they start backing away. And what you'll find is things like these, like reward pre sales, starts to demonstrate that people are in it. If you say, hey, I put this on Kickstarter. I reached my $10,000 goal in three weeks. I oversubscribe to $20,000 interesting. You have support for your idea. And so these different tools start to do things for you, build networks, as well as demonstrate that there's demand for your product. And that's a great thing to have. They come in and they have never done a Kickstarter, have put money in, it's just an idea. Well, it, that can be hard to get funding from people. And, but people do that. People try that every day. You know, they get very far with it. And so next step is you have things like the Texas Interest Day. And the reason I like the Texas interest state law is that it's a lower cost version of the Jobs Act. You don't have to do as much compliance work, you don't have to turn in reports to the federal government, so it's just cheaper to do. Allows non accredited investors to invest for equity, 5K limit for those who are not accredited. We all have to be in Texas. The company has to be in Texas and all the investors in Texas. And you can raise up to a million dollars and we have a fund, we have a, a crowdfunding portal like that and Nexi has one, Diversity Fund has one. And there's more on the list that's out there. The next step up is angels and angel networks, and these are the accredited investors, and they meet the accredited investor requirements. And these Central Texas Angel Network, how many people have heard of C10? You've heard of C10? It's an angel network that's here in town that's uh, got a lot of members and invested a lot of money, so they're doing very well. Is that, is that the abbreviated version of Central Texas? C10? C TAN is is the uh, acronym and it's called oh, Central Texas Angel Network. Got it. Yeah. And there's actually 16 of those groups or 17 of those groups around the state now. There's one in Houston, Houston Angel Network, Ag Angel Network, Baylor Angel Network, North Texas Angel Network. And there's about 16 of those groups. And for angels, that's one place to go to go find it. If you get money from one group, you can usually get money from other groups, and you just make your way around the circuit to other groups. Because if they put money in, they've done due diligence, they're in it, well, maybe I can get, uh, maybe I can do well with that as well. So, angels and angel networks are a great way to go and get more uh, funding for your deal if you have a growth story there. Next step up is venture capital. You may have tried to talk, go raise money from a VC. Um, they're looking for, you know, these are now funds managed by experienced professionals. Angels are people that are just investing their own money. And they're, they're, they're just writing 50, 100K checks or whatever it might be. Venture capital, they, they uh, raise 25, 50, 100 million dollar funds, and they're usually putting one to five million dollars into a deal. You get a million dollars to go take your deal to the next level. But what they're looking for is 10x the return. They put in a million dollars, they're looking for you to exit in five years for 10 million dollars or more. And there's two kinds of VCs out there. There's financial VCs, which is what most people would normally think of. I've raised a fund, I'm investing it, trying to get my investors the best return. What's coming up now is strategic VCs. These are companies like um, uh, Walmart, for example. They have a corporate VC, and they're investing for strategic reasons, not financial reasons. The, the local strategic VC for Walmart actually lives in Cedar Park. They have their office here. And they, they go around Central Texas, and they're looking for technologies to invest in that will help the group Walmart grow bigger. 
so they're looking for people and he, he listened to me about 20 things they wanted anything with logistics with robotics with retail with mobile apps with food and beverage and just everything related to Walmart and corporate VCs are doing things that are helping their business strategically and they often don't care about the financial impact so I did a consumer product goods conference uh, last month two months ago and I had Whole Foods sponsor it and it had the Whole Foods uh, corporate venture arm come out and talk about what they invested in and again it's very different and what he said is is if we know of a product that if it's on our shelf we'll sell it my job they had a 35 million dollar fund is to help get a product up there and don't care what if we make a financial return on the investment as long as the products on the shelf making us revenue through our retail channel that's what his job is so you will find with corporate venture capital and this is the part that's growing very dramatically uh, that they're doing things for non-financial reasons but more for strategic reasons pharmaceutical groups had started this 20 30 years ago they stopped many of those groups in the pharmaceutical industry stopped doing r d development they just started buying and investing in the uh, startups that were successful but what you'll find now is that's pervasive across the board just about every major corporation has a corporate bcr that's investing in early stage companies to help in some way with their business and the other trend in the venture capital world you know it used to be people go raise a hundred or five hundred or a billion dollar fund now there's many many of them that are raising 50 million dollar funds or 25 million dollar funds and that's why they're becoming much more specific and narrow and verbal in what they do and so the challenge is you have to go talk to a lot more people to find the ones that fit you but when they fit you boy they fit you very well and they can help you in a lot of ways also the last one are grant funding if you ever wanted to go out and get grants there's still quite a bit of money out there in the space that come and the, one of the advantages is it's non-dilutive in the sense that you're not giving up any equity not diluting your shares it's just grant money that comes in and you get to go to your project with it you don't have to go pay it back and typical sources are things like uh, the small business innovation research grant sbir is the one that most people go to first and SBIRs come from the government. Basically, every department of the government has to set aside a percent of their budget to put out in the form of SBIR grants. I met a colonel in the Air Force last year who said they put out enough money to fund 2,000 SBIR grants a year. And so there's quite a bit of money there to be had. Typically, you get about a million dollars for each of those SBIR grants. About 15% of people who apply actually get those. So it is competitive. The National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, there's a number of grant organizations out there. For the nonprofit, what you want to do is go look at uh, the foundation's books. And there is a, do you know how to go look up foundations? There is a facility on, in Austin, uh, about one block off of I-35 on 11th Street. That is a room that you go into that has a list and a computer set up for all the foundations in the world. And you go in and you type in what you do and how you do it, and it will tell you what foundations have grants for. <coughs> it's in the same building as the, um, uh, it's, a musical, it's a musical history, a history of music in Austin is what it is, and they share the building. So as you walk up the stairs, you're looking, looking at all these, you know, musicians of, of bygone eras and then you go to the top floor and there's this uh, room with all these computers and books mm -hmm. and so like the museum, still, of, hmm? museum of music east austin music history it's it's uh, that's not the exact name but we can look it up for you but uh, like i say one block east of i-35 on 11th street because i went over there because i was helping somebody look up uh for look up some foundations who would fund stem grants you know science technology and all that and so I was getting the list of all the family offices and all the funding programs and they're mostly ten twenty thousand dollar grants but once you have the list we then go and fill out the go apply for those grants is what you do so that's what you want to do for the grant side for the nonprofit is go look up foundations that are giving out money for what you are doing in your cause mm -hmm. and then UT has health cattle awards and the CEPRA is also a grant program as well, well the SBIR was a small business in innovation research. Innovation. So if you look up, well, you just Google SBIR, you'll find there's a lot of tools out there. And one of the tools you'll find is it, it, it goes, I mean, the government has a website, but you'll find that there's some 
private websites that interpret that, that tell you what are the topics they want to fund. So the idea is what you're trying to do is see how your business matches with what they want to fund. Because when the government giving out money, they're giving out money for things they need, things that they want to fund or foster. And so what you'll find is things like the DOD do these SBIR grants, but they're very, very specific. The NIH and NSF and these other SBIRs are very, very broad. So yes. I presume these are mostly targeted towards uh, new and new stuff or, or innovative stuff? Uh, in in many cases it is, yeah. Yeah, they're looking for new technologies, but they're also trying to solve current problems. And so it could be something that's not as new or innovative as there's no other products out there that are solving their problem. And so it's new in the sense that nobody's making it. And so you'll find that there may be an opportunity to get some government funding that would help you build your business at the same time solving their problem as well. Um, so I came with a funding roadmap. And so the idea here is you were starting off with an idea today and you were moving forward and you wanted to raise funding. The first thing you might want to do is go to the accelerators and get some mentorship and funding. And those accelerators are usually good for the ten to $100,000 uh, funding levels. It depends upon, you know, Techstars gives out 100K, other groups give out 10K, but it's something in there. Next thing is you want to go and you want to do some rewards funding like uh, Kickstarter, and you can raise 10 to $20,000 on Kickstarter. I found it, got, it gets hard to raise more than $20,000 for most deals. You, it, there's just not enough, you know, people out there that want what you're pre selling. But it's a great way to validate your product, great way to you know, get some feedback on it, get some support for it. And again, the guy that went to the angel investor and hadn't done anything, well, if you could say I went to an accelerator and I completed the course and I got $10,000 and I accomplished this with it, well, that's good. Then he goes and does a Kickstarter campaign, raises $20,000 and I was able to pre-sell 50 units, that's even better. And then you can work your way up to actually doing a, a small, an interest rate raise where I raise $250,000 from my customers, those guys who get the Kickstarter, they now bought my bought equity in my business. Well, this is sounding like a, there's some something here. All these people are in there doing this, putting money. This is now building support for my business. And so crowdfunding is what I call community funding. It, it builds a community support behind what you're doing. And that says a lot to people. Angel raise, you're now going in and getting high net worth individuals, and they play in the 250K to $2 million range. After $2 million, it's hard for them. And if you go to them for, for a deal less than $250, they are going to say, that's probably too small for me. I want something that's going to have a bigger return and we're going to be doing bigger things. And so the average, you know, when somebody says they want to start off with an angel raise, I say, well, we're going to, let's start with $250. let us not start with uh, $100 mm -hmm. and let us not start with $2 million. Let's start with $250, go raise a little bit of money, and then we'll go and raise more later. One of the issues you have when you raise money in this format here is you're giving up equity ownership of your business. And in the early days, your business is not, not worth very much, and so if you raise a lot of money, you give away a big chunk of the business. As you, you get bigger, more sales, more team, more product, more IP, your, your valuation goes up, and so the money you take in is going to be diluting you less. And so you don't want to raise too much early on, you want to raise just enough, and as you get a better valuation, you can raise bigger chunks of it without losing control of your company. So angel um, funding, uh, you say, is the most equity hungry funding? Typically, yes, yes, because unlike debt, angel funding is not secured. And so if you're raising 500K in a startup, you're typically giving up 25 to 30% of your company. And that, that's, that's a lot. So but, what's the order? Like angel funding is the most equity hungry, then comes VC or like Angel and VC are about the same. They're doing about you can count on giving up about a quarter of your business every time you go take those rounds. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you want to think hard about uh, having many, many rounds is uh, I I've seen founders at the exit table basically with seven percent of the company left because they've given up so much along the way. So that's why they, they serve a place, you know, they help grow the business and so forth. They bring other things to the table. But if you do too much of it, then it can be hard to make a good return at the end of the day unless the business grows to be worth quite a bit. Uh, next one is venture capital. 
Uh, what you'll find is there are some venture capital that come in early, like 200, 500K, and what have you. But mostly those guys start at uh, $2 million and they go northward up to 10 or $20 million is what they invest in. And it's the same thing, you're giving up 25, 30% of the company. And the challenge with venture capital is they, you know, it's institutional funding, so it's got a lot of, a lot more support behind it. It's not people just writing individual checks, it's people writing government checks, basically. And what they're doing is they're, they're trying to get to a very high growth rate, they want to take next return. And so you have to be on a fast, path, fast track to grow. Then you have these grants funding over here where the government's putting it in, and basically those are in the uh, 250 to $1 million range. SBIRs are $1 million, and there's other groups that are doing grants on a smaller level that's out there that can come in along the way. So, you know, the tips for fundraising is that when you go out to raise money, is the first thing you want to do is prepare your investor documents. Before you ever go out, go put an executive summary together, a pitch deck, five year financials, and a pitch video. When I say executive summary, you guys know what I'm talking about? It's basically a one pager of your business. And notice what's not up there the 50 page business plan book. You know, back in the day, we'd write a 50 page business plan book and we'd document everything that's going on. There was just one problem with that. Nobody reads them. And if they're not going to read them, I'm not going to write them. And so what I found is if you do a one-page exec summary, and then basically the pitch deck is a the story version of your business. It's, you know, how did I come across this? I had this problem. I went to find a solution. I couldn't find it. I created my own. Other people started asking me to buy it, and so I made a business out of it. And you have your story. And some, some investors like the story version better than the executive summary version. That's why I have both of them up there. But fundamentally, they're, it's the same information that's on those. The five year financials are five year financial performance. What does this thing look like? And this is what stands in for the, uh, the, five, the 50 page book. The idea is now we're going to model out in a form of all revenues and all expenses. And what investors get out of that is. You know, how fast are we planning to grow the business? When do we go cash flow positive? When do we break even? And so I would look, start looking at how you might model out a five year financial. And a lot of investors that judge your deal based on those five year financials. Uh, and what they're not looking for is accuracy. You said you're going to sell 50 units, you sold 50 units. That's not what they're looking for. What they're looking for is your knowledge of the business so that if you think hiring a person is going to cost, um, you know, $100,000, but that person's really a $200,000 person, then that tells them you don't really know your business. If, on the other hand, you can actually model it out and say, the person I want is going to cost me $120,000 that I know I'm going to hire. Okay, well, we now know the business. And so it demonstrates your expertise in the business, and you understand how much you're really going to sell, what the cost of it is. And the value of that, again, is not do I hit the number, but let's say I sell 50% of what I thought I was going to sell. Does my business model, do I know how it's going to impact my business model? How much negative will I be on the bottom line? What do I need to cut in order to keep from closing the doors? And you're un it just demonstrates you know your business very well. You know the model very well. And, and the last one is pitch video. And the reason I put this up here is that more and more of this stuff goes online. More and more you're now in interacting with angel investors in an online fashion. And in an angel group, when we started C10 10, 10 years ago, I'd have, if I were selling, if you were the investors and I was the company, I would come in and I would basically stand up here and have a 10 minute pitch. Well now, you're engaging a lot of these investors through online means and that 10 minute pitch is now a two minute pitch video on the website. And what you have to do is be able to say the same thing in about two minutes. And one thing about video is that it brings a lot of new values to the table. You can go show a picture of the problem you're solving, splice in customer testimonials, you can have a pitch explaining what you're doing and how you're doing it, you can demonstrate the problem. So there's a lot of advantages to the video, but it is greatly compressed. You don't have, I sometimes in my portal I get people who hand me 45 minute pitch videos. And I say, well, I hope you told them all the good stuff in the first two minutes, because that's all they're watching. They're not watching a 45 minute video. So start thinking about, you know, as I said before, principles of fundraising are the same. You have to build a network. You must have support for your business. You must go through the process of raising the funding. But now instead of having 50 page books and having live presentations, you now have documents that go online. You have pitch videos. 
And so the formats are changing, and the key to it is you have to be good at that sort of thing and start to master that. Next one is prepare your network. What you want to do is build a list of investor prospects. Raising funding is not unlike selling your product. When you go to sell your product, you have your product, and you have a list of prospects, and you go in and you engage them. They say it takes seven touches to close a sale, or a complex sale. So it takes seven touches to close an investor. And so you have your funnel of prospects. These are the guys that are interested. These are the guys that are trying it. These are the guys that bought the product. So over here with investors, these are the guys that I'm going to talk to. These are the guys that express interest. These are the guys who have invested. It's very much the same process. It takes seven touches over here. I go and introduce it. I go back and do another demo. I go give an update. Finally, they buy. Same thing over here with the investors. You have to do the process. So many people treat investors different from that. They go and they pitch once, and if they don't see a checkbook coming out, well, that's the pitch. Sorry. Well, no, you know, I, they, they say, well, they're not interested. Well, my message is they don't know if they're interested or not. They're still trying to figure out what they've got. And it takes several peeling back of the layers of the onion before people start to get a sense of what this is and what the questions are. and. And then they make the decision, yes, I'm in or no, I'm not. In the early days, they don't quite know what to ask, and so they don't say anything. And so a lot of people misinterpret that as lack of interest. And of course, we have to demonstrate that we have a growth story. So when people come to me and they say, hey, I want to go on the portal, or I want to go meet investors, my, my, my first question is, can you demonstrate the growth story? Things are moving up into the right sales, you're hiring more people, you're building more product, and if you can, you almost always can raise money. If you can, cannot, it's very hard. I have people coming in saying, it's a rocket to the moon. And then we watch them every month, and it's flat. Well, where's the rocket? And investors are not investing in a flat deal, they're investing in something that's moving up into a rocket. So you have to have a growth story at some level. And the last one is prepare your campaign. You know what they'll say when you launch the portal? And that's, we had a lot of people come in when I was at C10 and they'd say, got a great deal, hey, look at me, everybody turns their attention. And raising funding in an angel network on a crowdfunding portal is tantamount to walking out on stage and telling everybody, hey, look at what I got. Everybody turns their attention and looks at you, now what? What are you going to say? And that's where these campaigns come in, where you think through what am I going to tell people every week, every other week, every month. Every month to show that the product is getting better, the customers are getting more, revenue is growing up, and the team is getting better. And so you have to think through how you're going to tell that story out there. Because investors really come in, like your deal, pull out the check, go through the check. They rarely do that, not for any real money anyway. They have to see this thing going up. So in summary, the accelerators give you mentorship. Rewards crowdfunding gives you product validation. Equity crowdfunding gives you what I call market validation because now investors are putting money into something that they think, oh, that's really good. And then uh, angels are giving you money for go-to-market funding. What they do, what their angels want to be there at the point when you sold a little bit to the market and it's positive, and now we're really going to go into the market in a full way. Now we're going to go in there in a big way. And they can help bring team members to the, to the process as well, which helps. Uh, equity crowdfunding brings in uh, customer validation to it. You gotta get the right price, you got the right market, you got the right product fit, and so forth. The venture capital is for growth funding. You know, it's not all working, it's proven, the models are known, but I want to scale from $1 million revenue to $10 million revenue, and that's what the growth funding does for you. And then grants come in, they can do various things for you along the way. And then, um, like I say, if you want to get the startup funding list, of those 81, just grab a card, grab an email, and I'll email you a PDF, and you can see what's out there, and then you can go back and look at the kind of funding you need for what you're trying to do. So what questions do you guys have about funding your deal? What would you want to do next? When you say uh, angels and talk about board and market funding, um, at what point in your business, is it just that you've got five years of performance and an idea that they go, wow, yeah, this is trading well, this is it. Do you have to have some uh, financial history in terms of 
where in the product validation process did the angel come in? So you've got a good product market fit. Uh, you've tested it out and you know what the right price is. You know what the right business model is. You haven't sold a lot, but you sold a little bit, either in the beta version or just a handful of customers. And these are all known things. The thing, I, the way I always say it is, investors, a lot of people don't want to tell me their revenue because the numbers are not big. In fact, they try to hide the numbers and they just want to tell me about the future. We play the futures game a lot. You know, how much revenue do you have? Oh, next year I'm gonna have $5 million. Well, how much do you have now? The year after that's gonna be ten million dollars. And well you're not telling me what you got. And so the numbers are not big. But what investors are looking for is not big. They're looking for predictable. If you can come in and tell me, I you know, when I worked at National Instruments, we had a rule. For every lead at the top of the funnel, it was worth three hundred dollars at the bottom of the funnel. And it would take three months to go through the process. So we go to a trade show, we knew how many of those leads would actually come to a seminar, one out of three, and then of those, one out of three would then come and express interest in us buying the product. And so you tell me what revenue, what revenue you want over here, I want a million dollars, I could work back because the, uh, the internal sales guy calling up had a 92% success rate. And he was just basically saying, these are the products you need, here's the price, I'll, I'll give you the product, but you gotta pay for it and so forth. So take one million dollars, okay, 92% are gonna buy, the average sell price is 2,400 bucks. Okay, I need this many seminar leads coming out, I need this many trade show leads coming out. The whole process was three months. I know what, what it costs to do each of those pieces. And if you can demonstrate something at that level, it's a sure winner you're gonna raise money because it's a no predictable model. Don't care how big the numbers are. Because I know if I put money into it, it's just gonna make it all bigger. But what most people do is they hide the fact that it's small, they don't emphasize the fact that they know those things. Now, if you don't know those things, that's what you want to get to, is a predictable business model. How much does it cost to acquire the leads and how do you do that? How much does it cost to warm them up? How much does it cost to close them? Then how much does it cost to keep them happy, support and upgrades and those type of things? So think along the lines of a sales funnel and what do you know about your business today and what do you not know about it? And that's what you want to go and start building out is what those different pieces are and then demonstrate that it works. Not with huge volumes, because you don't have the money for that, but with enough volume that you can actually show a funnel saying this is how it usually works. And with software, the model is pretty much the same. You get people interested, they do a demo or a try and buy, then they buy one version of the product, then they sign up to be a recurring customer. And those are kind of the four stages. And if you can get two or three or four people working through that, you can then start to measure time and dollars to do that. That's what investors are looking for. I don't care if it's 100 customers, three or four or five is all I need to know. But I need to know you have a process route that is repeatable and predictable. What was the other question you guys had? I mean, what can be funded with the money raised? What cannot be funded? What can or cannot be, yeah. Hmm. When you say what can or cannot be funded, what do you mean by that? I mean, what kind of expenses, like, I mean, is the founder, the uh, salary accounted in it? Or is it only the hires? Or is it the lawyer fees accounted in it? I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. Sure. So the thing you want to do, and I see often, in, in a fundraise scenario, you always want to put down the use of funds. And a lot, oftentimes, people put down their salaries, okay? Most of what you're doing is going to have to pay somebody to do something. But what investors want to know is um, money in is business values out. I give you money, how many leads are you going to generate? How many sales are you going to close? How many products are you going to build? How many team members are you going to hire to do those different things and so forth? So you never want to say salaries because the, uh, to your point, people, angel investors start to envision lavish salaries for CEOs and so forth. And what they're really trying to figure out is what, um, what business values can you get out. So one of the techniques you want to use here is a lot of people you know, take 10K out of their pocket or they get 50K from family and they put it into an account and they can go start the business. And anytime you raise money, you, or, or you collect money and put to the business, you want to identify what that is and what you got out of it. And so one of the best, and people don't want to do that usually because the numbers aren't big. 
I pull 10K out of my pocket, put it in my bank account to start my business, that was only 10K. But what I always say is that's a good proxy for how you invest money or how you deploy money. And so if I did that, I'd say I put 10K in a big in an account. I was able to build a prototype version of my product. I was able to get two team members lined up with me. I was able to get a provisional patent file, and I was able to sell two customers with it. So you give me money, I'll give you business results. Then my family gave me 50K, and I was able to turn that product into a final shipping product. I was able to get hired, uh, hire one more person. I was able to file two more patents. I was able to close 10, 10 customers worth uh, $50,000. Well, this is starting to sound like an interesting story because money in is business values out. And that's what you want to explain to them. Again, the, the dollar size is not important as much as that conversion rate is what they're all looking for. And so that's what you want to do is start to, whenever somebody says I raised a million dollars and now I'm raising another million dollars, you know, astute investors are always listening for what happened to the first million dollars? What did you do with it? And some people are very good about explaining that. Other people are not good about explaining that. And one of the keys with pitching angels or other investors is um, you have to articulate it in order to get credit for it. So if you don't put it out there, I have revenue, investors are thinking you have zero revenue. So if you don't mention it, in the investor's mind, it does not exist. So if you have revenue, say you have revenue, otherwise you're walking out the door saying too bad you didn't have revenue. And so most of the challenge you have in pitching investors is articulating all the values that you have in the business. Sales, team, product, IP, fundraise, those are the core five that investors want to hear for. What they don't care so much about is how big the market is, or how it's growing, or how the fell down. And the reason they don't like that is because you're not in control of those things, you're in control of these things. What, and they want to know what you're doing. You know, as you are you closing sales, are you hiring good team members, are you building good products, are you raising money, and you're in charge of that, so they're looking very hard at the specifics of what you're doing, not what is going on in general in the marketplace. And so that's why you want to focus on those things and go through your business with those set five things and start asking, what things do I have in my business? What values do I have in my business that I want to put out there? Same thing with nonprofits. Think about the work that you're doing, think about the team you've built, think about the service you're offering, think about these other things, and write down very clearly what the values are in that business or in that nonprofit and make that clear to your donors that money that was donated to you was giving you good values in your organization. Which yeah. kind of like overwhelms me about my project <laughs> because it's it's very intangible in many ways. Like what, what I'm really like dreaming about is like a world culture center where you can just like have like an umbrella for people from different backgrounds in the world to kind of like get together and like share knowledge with the community about music and art in general. So I feel like it's hard when you are like on the culture and art business because it's hard to show investors like a revenue that you can actually like put on a, on a number, you know what I mean? The benefit for the community, it's many of the times it's like on the long term and in, in ways that you, you necessarily can like put on numbers. Mm -hmm. so, so you may want to start with activity metrics. When I was at National Instruments and we started a brand new business unit, we really didn't have big revenue numbers and we didn't have customer ROI results, we didn't have all that stuff. And so in the early days, we'd just do activity numbers. How many people got trained on the product? How many people got exposed at the trade show? How many people uh, came to the conference? And we'd just use activity metrics because in the early days, you don't have revenue metrics or not meaningful ones anyway. So you want to start off with activity metrics. And at some point, you want to put numbers into it because that speaks a lot to investors. If I stand up and say, hey, I've got a great product that's better than the competition, well, that's one thing. I see them say, hey, my product, it saves you 30% on your cost compared to competition. That's much more impactful because now I have a number. I'm now an expert because I know my numbers. I'm actually tied to specific values that are you know, tangible versus a better. 
because everybody's better. You know, but how much better you are says a lot about you and your product because you're much further along. So while you may not have revenue and the usual things that go with the you know, you know, for-profit businesses, you can still go out and talk about the number of people that are, were exposed to your message, uh, came to your conference, uh, signed up and engaged in your workshops, and demonstrate in an activity format how much activity is going on. At some point down the way, you would try to get to other metrics that would go with your deal. Because in the end, they're going to look for something a little more tangible to know that a dollar in is X result out. And we have to figure out how to go do that. One thing to do is go look at other nonprofits to see how are they communicating their results to donors. One of the metrics that they use in the nonprofit world is how much, what percent of the donated money goes to administration versus the actual work. And uh, some groups are very good. It used to be the magic number was 92%. If 92% goes to the work, then you are an efficient machine mm -hmm. and you were doing well. Uh, someone once said the Wounded Warriors, I think maybe 21 cents on the dollar actually went to Wounded Warriors. The rest of it went to administration. And they, they had a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of things going on there for sure, but you know, that's, that's a metric you can put your hands on that says we're an efficient operation if you had just that number. And maybe, maybe you're better than 92%, we'll see. Yeah, Any other one, questions? one thing you can look at here in Austin, there's a group called Mission Capital. So it's missioncapital.org. Mission uh, Capital. Mission Capital. So there, they used to be a group called Green Lights. And Green Lights used to basically train nonprofits on how to be better at what they do. Mm -hmm. What they're doing now is Mission Capital has kind of changed their focus and they're really focusing on, it's kind of a new generation of people that are investing in nonprofits mm -hmm. uh, or that are putting money up for nonprofits. Um, they're a little bit more mission oriented mm -hmm. and want to see results for the money that they're putting in. So you've got a lot of these millennial generation folks that have a lot of money mm -hmm. and they're putting it up and saying, well, okay, I'm giving you this, but I want to see something in, in return. Mission uh, capital. Missioncapital.org. So it's, it's a great resource here in Austin, especially. Thank you very much. Hey, Paul. Yes. What, what would be, you know, so I'm thinking from our world here, uh, as we're training folks to, to go out and look for these type of things, what's a good resource as far as learning maybe how to pitch investors, um, get some training in those type of basics, where would you suggest? There's lots of uh, pitch competitions around town. It's great to go to those and see people pitching on stage of different styles uh, and different uh, types of investors, so you will see different formats that go on to it. Uh, while you're on the website, you'll see a lot of really great pitches there as well. Here we've gone through Kickstarter, hit the play button on about 20 of them, you'll start to see there's a very strong correlation between the pitch on the website and the amount of money they've raised. And you'll start to see you know, quality of video, uh, focus of the presentation, and you'll start to figure out what, what makes for a very good pitch. And then you start to see how it might go from there. So watching other people is one of the best ways to do that. Watching other videos is there's plenty of those out there on Indiegogo and other sites as well. Trying to get a sense of uh, how they communicate, what you hear, what you don't hear, what questions they answer, what questions they don't answer. And it's, it can be a little bit of a challenge because no matter how much time you give somebody, it's never enough. Uh, back when we had 10 minute pitch, they just couldn't get it all in 10 minutes. Well, now they have a two minute video. And, and partly what you have to do is start using mediums and graphics and displays to communicate, not just say words for everything, because that can be overwhelming to people as well. So there's different techniques you can use to get things and you learn a lot from other people and how they communicate something and how they deliver information as well. So, any other questions you have for me at this point? Yes. So, so it's not a question. Is, uh, you mentioned uh, the five important bodies for the company. Uh, I didn't get those. So it's sales, revenue. And, and that's everything. That's how many people are expressing interest and the leads are coming in, how many downloads we're getting. That's all. You know, user demand. Uh, team, who's on your team? 
And in fact, a lot of investors, that's the first thing to look for. Who's on the team, do they have the right skills, do they have the complete, do they know what they're doing, do they have the industry experience? Uh, intellectual property, do I have patents, do I have something that defends this business very well? Uh, fundraise, um, how, how well am I doing? One of the challenges with investors is nobody wants to go first. Mm -hmm. And so getting your network to put some money in first really helps a lot. And uh, sales team, product, fundraise, IP, and uh, what was the last one? Uh, oh, product. You know, how is the product uh, uh, doing? Is it in a prototype phase? Is it in a shipping phase? Is it in a final phase? Is it robust, mature, or whatever? And so you can use those to figure out or demonstrate. Because those are the core things that you're doing in a business. And you want to demonstrate your investors, you're making progress in all of those. So in our program, what we do is we put a deal out to the website, see who's interested in it, create an investor prospect list, these guys are interested at some level. And then we're giving updates every two to four weeks. And we, and we want short bullet points in each of those five things. And in every two to four weeks, we're putting out there things that are happening with those. And we're trying to get those seven touches in. One of the best techniques I ever saw was a guy that came to me and said, I'm not raising funding now, but in six months I will be. Can I keep you informed of my progress? Well, yeah, let's, let's see what's going on. And the beauty of that is there's no pressure. I, I don't have to make a decision to invest, but he tell, he's telling me he's going to do that in six months. He's going to start a raise. And then what he does is every month he gives me an update. Sales team probably fundraising my P. And I'm watching this thing and I'm seeing it grow, mature, develop. Wow, it's good business. And I've got my seven touches in. I've educated them on it. I demonstrated I can do it. And then in six months when it's time to do the fundraise, you go back and say, well, I'm ready to raise my fund. And at that point, he's got all these people, usually he's got 10 or 15 or 20 people on that on those lists looking at this thing, who I'm ready to raise my money, uh, you're now well ahead of the game. When the fundraise starts, it's a lot easier because I've prepared my investors for it. So in Kickstarter and crowdfunding, the secret there is you see these guys that go on the Kickstarter campaign and I raised my money in five days. Well, how did they do that? Was because it was just a superstar product, or was it just a great team, or what was it? But the answer was they started three months in advance and went around to people and said, well, you put money in, yeah, you put in 500, okay, I put your name down 500, we put in 200. They, they build the prospect list before they ever go live on the campaign. And the rule behind crowdfunding is you want to raise or identify 10 to 20% of the raise before you ever go live. And one of the reasons you do that is when you go out to people and say, hey, I'm going to offer this for this price, would you do it? If everybody's saying, no, I wouldn't do that, well, then you're going to have to go change something. Change the product, change the price. But now you're offering a price and product, people are starting to say, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do that. And so, okay, well, now we're in the game for that. And you keep a list of all these people that are saying yes, first name, last name, email address, and how much. And when that adds up to be 10 to 20%, you're ready to go crowdfund. If you don't have that list, you're not ready to go crowdfund. So once you go live on that website, um, you know, it's, you know you, you've got to get some momentum going on. If I ever put a deal on my website that had zero funds raised from day one and we went to zero, it's going to be zero a month later, three months, nobody's going first because having to go up zero means nobody's interested. Not even your network's interested. And so that's why when you put it up on the website, in two or three days it pops up 20-30% because they had their network go and say, yeah, I'll do it. When you put it on the website, you go email everybody, okay, it's live now, you can put your money in. And then here comes this big rush. It's not because somebody just discovered a great product, it's because uh, you pre-sold it, so to speak, and prime the pump to get it going. And investors don't want to go first, so if I, if I don't know you, and you know, then I'm looking for you to get your network involved in it, and then, hey, I'll join in as well. So that's how that works. And, why you want to go out and prime the pump before you start raising your money is you can test it and you can build that list, get those touches in, and then it's easier when it's time to go raise the money itself. Cool. All right, great. Well, thank you guys for coming out. Appreciate you your time. Much.